and we are live good evening and good day to everybody watching this live and greetings to all of you who will watch this podcast or listen to it in the future as you all know my guest today is professor gautam radhakrishna desi raju uh, Professor Desi Raju is a structural chemist who has been in the solid state and structural chemistry unit of the Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore, since 2009. Before that, he has been in the University of Hyderabad for 30 years. He is one of the most highly cited Indian scientists of all time, with over 450 research papers and over 60,000 citations and an H index of 100. That's incredible. Uh, he has won numerous international awards like the Alexander von Humboldt Forschungspreis, the TWAS Award in Chemistry, the ISA Medal for Sciences of the Uni University of Bologna. He is a former prof president of the International Union of Crystallography. And currently, he's the chairman of the Governing Council of the Bose Institute in Kolkata. He is also a member of the India Science 20 Secretariat and the S20 India Core Engagement Group in the G20 India Presidency Year 2023. And his recent book, Bharat India 2.0, this book here, is his first publishing venture outside of the scientific domain. And it's concerned with the constitutional history of India and the reimagination of India as a civilizational state rather than a nation state. And that is the book. This is the book that is going to be the topic, the subject matter of our discussion, our conversation today. So, sir, welcome to the podcast. It's an honor to be able to finally speak with you. Abhijit, thank you so much indeed for having me on your podcast. And I'm looking forward to this conversation. Thank you also for that uh, crisp in introduction. And uh, I guess we let's start talking about the book itself, because I think that's what mm, people are here to listen to. Indeed, sir. Indeed, sir. So uh, this... Uh, is a it's, is a book that covers a very large amount of material uh it it deals it has uh, i think four sections roughly a uh, section of, of that deals with the history of the constitution from 1858 to about 1950 then there is a section on india 1.0 then there's a description of the civilizational state and then there is the section on india 2.0 now i found this book really surprising because it is fast paced and gripping which is uh, something you would not typically associate with the book on about the constitution so i was really surprised with that and it's a fascinating and thought provoking book i think i'm going to need two three more readings to properly assimilate and digest the, in, uh, the information so let me begin with the most logical and natural question what sir made you write this book you are a scientist what prompted a scientist to venture into the field of the constitution and and write this book well sometimes it's Hard to say, Abhijit, why things happen. Uh, the immediate provocation for writing this book was the COVID pandemic and lockdown. Because uh, all of a sudden, literally overnight, I wasn't able to go to the institute or to the lab or see my students and postdocs. And uh, so here I was sitting at home and I've never felt like wasting time. So I started reading about, well, the constitution. And you may say, why the constitution? Uh, here the answer is slightly longer. I've always been interested in history. And uh, it's my great regret that in my time, you couldn't do a school leaving exam offering both uh, history and chemistry. I think maybe that situation prevails even today. I am not very sure. But uh, anyway, I was always interested in history and uh, I've been reading about history. Uh, as I've explained in the preface of the book, the turning point for me came in the 1975 emergency when I was actually a PhD student in the USA and uh, returning to India shortly thereafter, after I finished my PhD and picked up a couple of years of work experience there. Uh, so I came back in 78, which if you will recollect, most of the people in the audience were not even born in those days. But those were the wild days of the Janata Party government. Indira Gandhi had just lost the election. And so we had this Janata Party, which uh, kind of crumbled in a few years, and Indira Gandhi came back. 
and uh, so in those days of course i mean uh, my interest in the goings on national politics was just like anyone else i was so totally immersed in my job in the university of hyderabad and beginning a research career uh, research is a very very daunting proposition it's a profession not meant for everyone and i took it very seriously and so it was just a casual interest in what was happening but by the late 80s i would say we were uh, indian politics and indian current affairs were really in the roller coaster phase you know rajiv gandhi was he was elected with an overwhelming majority the sympathy vote and so the question arose to my mind that okay it is bad and sad that indira gandhi died but was it necessary for the president of india to swear in rajiv gandhi immediately he wasn't even a member of parliament if you recollect so i was wondering what was going on is this a kind of a monarchy where the new king is you know, the queen is dead long live the king kind of thing so mm -hmm. you know, i think it was a thought that occurred to many people i mean it's not i'm not alone many of the feelings and gut instincts that i had i think were shared by many educated people in the country and the 90s were really crazy these coalition governments then rajiv gandhi himself was assassinated and then the narsimrao years and then we went i mean 1995 to about 2000 was even crazier because so many of these coalition governments yes, uh, rajiv gandhi withdrawing support uh, to i think uh, chandrashekar's government uh, it was actually crazy i mean and then obviously the governance suffers and in the end the people suffer so seemed to me at that time that the country was going nowhere but those were also the years when my research output was a maximum so i wasn't really you know just like anybody else you know we discuss and it's a university so i also got to know very many of my colleagues in the social sciences school so we used to talk and in those days the general drift of much academic discussion was uh, i would say mildly leftist mm -hmm. and this was very normal for those days and uh, of course we didn't know at that time many of the things i think i was not a regular reader of economic and political weekly for example but uh, it was only later that uh, we became aware of the very cynical bargain that mrs gandhi made with the communists in 1971 where in exchange for political support she allowed them a free run of the education system yes and the university of hyderabad <clears throat> uh, in particular was one of the starting points for the leftist uh, dogma and movement in academic institutions in india and i mm -hmm. saw it from a very early stage almost from the embryonic stage mm, even by the middle to late 80s it had started as you know what you finally saw as rohit vemula and all that was you know the bizarre conclusion of all these things but all this was really building up quite a bit so this whole idea of jnu you know people talk about the idea of india so i was the idea of jnu the idea of hyderabad university the idea of jadavpur university see all these things were coming i was getting more interested in these matters around 2000 and uh, mm -hmm. then of course the years of uh, the upa1 and upa2 really i began to feel that something is really wrong because by that stage i was actually talking and got to know a few people in the political side and also in the bureaucratic side these were all perfectly ordinary normal well thinking people and so why are they behaving in this crazy way in the public sphere i mean what is it about it why are they so obsessed about this 272 number and making you know standing on their heads to get 272 literally and this process of in 2004 you know mrs uh, sonia gandhi saying she doesn't want to become the prime minister and suddenly manmohan singh is brought out of nowhere and uh, other such things so the whole thing looked to me quite crazy mm. and uh, 
when I started reading the constitution, now fast forward to the pandemic time, mm -hmm. 2019, mm, I'm a scientist, as you said originally. So we scientists always, we think a little bit different from social scientists. We try to take a situation which I felt that by 2014, it had completely, the country had gotten to a point of no return. And mm -hmm. there was no way in which we were going to, you know, sustain the kind of stuff we saw between 20, 2004 and 2014. And um, then a scientist uses what is called Occam's razor, uh, which is I've referred to in my book that when you have a certain set of situations occurring, you look for the simplest reason. Yes. You don't look for the more complicated reasons. And uh, and this is where I think social scientists and scientists, uh, with all humility, let me say, um, scientists do look for reasons. Whereas I feel that uh, social scientists in general tend to amplify on the situation as it is, or they're, they're more interested in the causes. Mm -hmm. the causes finally don't matter to a scientist because our whole discipline is we don't we just look at the past but it's one of the most iconoclastic of uh, endeavors science so what is yes. there today is gone, is gone tomorrow and the only thing that scientists crave is something that we never get and that is immortality so <laughs> you know, it's it, it, it's very typical of us and so uh, what you said today is gone tomorrow, something else comes which is better. Scientists look for solutions. We yes. can be a bad solution. It can be a solution which even when we propose, we know it is not the complete solution. Yes. But we will put forth a solution. It is the solution that actually gets discussed, criticized, improved. And so the causes are important, Abhijit, in the sense that Unless you understand the causes, you will not know why this has happened. Yes. But at that point, you quickly give up the thing. You take the situation for what it is and say, given all this, what is the best solution? Yes. This is a kind of reverse thinking, which we there is a word for it in science. It is retro thinking. You know, we take the final thing and then work back and start saying that if since these were the causes, can we provide a solution that will not result in those particular causes? Yes. That is how we usually think. And so my chapter four, which gives a solution, uh, the many, many good books that have been written recently, covering sorts of the topics that have covered India, India's past and the various things that have happened in Indian history over the last thousand years. So many good books by authors who have discussed. And that's one nice thing today. You have a lot of books coming out and things to read. Uh, I think where my book, because I am a scientist, somebody who reviewed my book told me only a scientist could have written this book about <laughs> the constitution. He says that uh, sometimes a scientist, you know, Occam razor based uh, way of thinking might provide a much cleaner and easier solution than uh, the kind of things that social scientists will uh, propose. I'm not a bit of a generalization, I know, uh, but I find that solutions as such are few and far between in books that are written by non-scientists. Yes. And so when you say scientists, why, why a scientist? Why not a scientist? And the other thing is more emotional. Looking at the newspapers and looking at the antics of places like my former university, University of Hyderabad or JNU and so on. Mm -hmm. I said our constitution is not the private property of the social sciences departments of a couple of these leftist universities. Indeed. And also equally likely, it is not the property of lawyers and judges of the various courts. Yes. Their, their job is to interpret the constitution maybe and uh, try to, within the existing system of laws, to find out if the legislature is doing its job properly or something like that. But they certainly don't. and. You know, one of the things I've seen in science 
whenever people get very touchy and defensive, they go resort to their jargon, which nobody else can understand. Yes, we true. scientists do it all the time. I'm not saying that. Whenever we understand a phenomenon incompletely, we tend to go into jargon. Simply so that others don't understand what we're talking about. <laughs> Sometimes what happens is we don't understand ourselves. You know, we, we get seduced by our own jargon. And right. I felt where the judges and the lawyers were guilty of this. I mean, if you read the constitution itself, the text, mm -hmm. it can be written in very simple language. You don't need to put all those things. Really, you don't. Yes. yes. The constitution is something that any, any of us can read. You should be able to read it. I should be able to read it. You know, and... Uh, Okay, it is written in a sort of a legal language to safeguard against certain situations which might not have been anticipated. So, to exercise a certain amount of care in what is written, we put it in a legal language. But it doesn't mm -hmm. mean that it becomes unapproachable to anybody else. Well, it's uh, it's the blueprint for the country. It's so many little things and not so little things in my daily life are governed by what's in that constitution. Yes. So if I don't know something about it, uh, you know, then that's pretty bad. And I started talking to some intelligent scientists, well-known people. Then the third point, I found the level of ignorance was quite bad. Mm. Many of these educated people who are actually quite well-known, I mean, <laughs> uh, they don't know the difference between a democracy and a republic. Right. They said, we thought it's the same thing. So forget even saying something like Article 15. That will be Greek and Latin to them. Democracy and Republic, if you don't know, then how will you know nation state, civilizational state and all that? It's, you are expecting too much. So I felt, and you said my book is written in a sort of a fast moving way. That was also completely intended. Mm -hmm. And I wanted it to be read like a storybook. Right. Yes, that's why I've not put references in the book in the main text, but I've just given a reading list at the end. Yes, because I, this is not a this is not a scientific paper that I'm submitting to a journal, uh, so that the referee can say you have cited me or you have not cited me. Yes, it often is the only thing that referees do actually. You know, they they don't care. <laughs> they only care if they've been cited or not. So the point of this book is not a scholarly. It's not a scholarly work. Because I am not, right. uh, I am not in that. That's not my domain expertise. But I think it is something that is important for ordinary people to know. Ordinary people like me. And right. because in this particular domain, I am just an ordinary person. I, I'm a well wisher, and I just want India to be the top country in the world. In about right. 25, 25, 30 years, I want us to be the top country in the world. So that my motivations are all very simple. And I think they're shared by literally millions of mm -hmm. educated people all over the country. So I wanted to write a book that will bring this, you know, arcane thing called the Constitution. If I can hold this book up, I don't know. Yeah, you you seem to have better luck with it than myself. <laughs> okay. Hmm. So I wanted to bring this arcane thing called the Constitution more into mm -hmm. a familiar domain of the intelligent and interested reader. So mm -hmm. that and many of the people who have read the book have told me their first reaction actually was that, oh, we just didn't know all these things. We just didn't know. And it said right in the beginning, it's got a lot of facts and covers. Yes, I yes. tried to put in many factual things. Because that's the other thing. I have not put too many of my opinions. I have put in the facts. So that people, this is again a typical scientist behavior, data, 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 more yes. data better data, more accurate data. Yes. So I'm giving you all the data. Now, dear reader, you please draw your own conclusion. You tell me right. if there is anything that I'm saying here that is not logical, that is not correct. And, uh, you know, just this morning I saw some wise person has said that, Opinion is the worst form of appearing to be educated. Because, you know, opinions are just opinions. So, I mean, and somebody reading my book will possibly, you know, I, I've rarely said, you know, I, I feel that this is the case. I think this is the case. I think, right, nothing. Yes. I think nothing and I felt nothing when I wrote this book. Mm -hmm. I said, dear reader, these are the facts. 
This is what has happened. And if I use Occam's razor, then this is what comes by the end of chapter 2. That the basic documentation for our governance is wrong. Right. So that is, that is the, by the end of chapter 1 and chapter 2, chapter 1 gives the background. Yes. 50 years leading up to independence, that there was a constitutional history of India before 1947. So that is yes. chapter 1. If you say take chapter 2, the end of chapter 2, which is the longest chapter in the book, yes. is that there is something wrong with the main plan itself. I took out a laptop. You are sitting in front of a laptop. I am sitting in front of a laptop. Suppose the operating system is defective. Mm -hmm. No matter how good the input, you will only get a rubbish output. Yes. So we may have had many, many nationalistic, many, many patriotic, many, many people who love their country. But suppose you're forced to work within the constraints of a document that is itself flawed and imperfect. Yes. And don't forget, all bureaucrats, all legislators, everybody in this country has to operate within the limits, four corners of the constitution. Yes. We can't do anything outside that constitution. So suppose the constitution itself is flawed, then no matter what we may do, then it's not, the output is not going to be enough. It's not going to be sufficient. And this is what, again, as a scientist, I felt that having visited so many countries and having observed scientists, very well-educated people from so many different countries, I the firm opinion, I've been traveling abroad now for 50 years. I mm -hmm. firmly feel that the average IQ of the Indian is higher than in the rest of the world. I agree. IQ, or general awareness, general intelligence, yes. general logicality, general ability to relate cause and effect. This is all a bit higher for us. We have got tremendous natural resources. Yes. We have got a nice population demography now. We've got so many things going for us. Why then is our progress not enough? Indeed. I feel it is not enough. The 75 years whatever we are putting, and this is a totally politically neutral statement because we've had so many different kinds of governments, so many different parties, everything has changed. But when you look at other countries, what they have done in 75 years, and what have we done in 75 years? There's so much natural, natural talent in this country, then again and again, it points to the same thing. The problem lies in the constitution itself. The problem doesn't lie in us. It doesn't lie in the politicians. The politicians do crazy things because they are forced to work within that constitution. Yes. Suppose there was a neat and nice constitution which really expressed what was happening here. I don't think we would have had all these problems. The amount of suffering that... See, I am a bit older than all you guys. I have seen the worst of the 1960s and 1970s and all. It was very bad. You know, mm, yes. People yes. who were uh, people in the middle classes and the upper middle classes where I belonged, daily life was a grind. Mm -hmm. Not easy. You know, and then imagine the people who are much poorer. Yes. It would have been simply awful. So, I mean, I think we have all been put through the grinder, as it were. For 75, I think we deserve better. And uh, Yes. Which is also the reason why, as a scientist, even I wrote this book. So, very long answer to your question, but I think it sort of summarizes my motivations and uh, feelings when I actually wrote this book and why I wrote it the way I wrote it. Right, sir. So, in the in the preface itself, you have identified the constitution as itself containing nucleation points. Mm -hmm. The seeds for future faults and dislocations. Right. So, so that's what you have mentioned in the preface itself. So, I would like to ask you in the beginning a fundamental question: that what is the point of a constitution? What function does a constitution serve? Does every nation need one? The UK doesn't have one, and before the British era, India never had one. So, why is a constitution needed in the so-called modern era? Okay. See, to answer, there are two parts of this question. Mm -hmm. First is, why does any country need a constitution? Yes. Second is this unwritten constitution of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. Yes. Now, easiest, 
is to talk about the constitution. Mm -hmm. Come right in the beginning of a book. See, page two, mm -hmm. if I may read, Abhijit. Yes, sir. In the middle of page two, every country in the modern world has a constitution. Mm -hmm. One could elaborate and say every independent country in the modern world. Because you are mm -hmm. right, a colony doesn't need a constitution. Yes. In the end, it doesn't need. And basically, the British ruled us without a constitution. They yes, pretended indeed. that there was something, but there was nothing. Okay, yes. every country in the modern world has a constitution. Now look, a document that outlines aspirations, mm -hmm. sketches priorities, emphasizes rights and duties, and provides overall guidance for effective day-to-day -day governance. So, yes. outlines aspirations, what we want as a people, what do we want? Does that constitution of ours tell us properly what we all want? Mm -hmm. It's just priorities. You can't do yes. everything. So what do you do first? Emphasizes rights and duties. Not yes. just rights. Because if you have rights without duties, which is what we have now, yes. you will have uh, people, you know, uh, urinating in the business class of Air India. Yes, indeed. Yes. Mm -hmm and provides overall guidance for effective day-to-day -day governance. That is all the, the rules and regulations that uh, you know come after part four of the constitution. Mm -hmm. Those are all the regular how to do the things. A mm -hmm. nation wherein the constitution is in tune with the spirit of the people, captures the spirit, becomes, okay, etc., etc. So that is the constitution is actually a blueprint for any independent country. Mm -hmm. And a little bit, it should be time neutral. Mm -hmm. should be something that is so very well encapsulates the nature of the people that it should stand the test for a long time. It should yes. not be something that you're going on changing all the time. Yes. And because the changing on all the time, it is just like a knee-jerk reaction to a local problem. Yes. Some Jailalta wants something and she wants to make it 69%. You need her... Uh, help to you know keep some majority so you give her a 69 percent constitution should not be like that a constitution yes. should not depend on jailalita's moods i think that 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 is what a constitution is all about the second question you have asked is very very interesting which again i have described in great detail mm -hmm. all the countries of the world except one have a written constitution yes one country doesn't have a written constitution, the country that you mentioned. Yes. And in our great wisdom, we chose that constitution as our <laughs> Okay. Indeed. Need I say more? And why do they have an unwritten constitution? For the simple reason that thousand years ago, they realized that they needed a constitution. The first attempt was King John and the Magna Carta. When hmm. they nobles came and forced him to make some concessions and sign something. That was 800 yes. years ago. The other thing is more a geographical accident. Being an island, they were never overrun by any other country. As was true in the rest of Europe and large parts of Asia. Yes. You had that uh, 22 miles of what they call the ditch. That, that 22 miles has saved them for 1000 years. Yes, yes. He was actually able to go there and set up shop over there. So as a result, they could experiment. Mm. And boy, what a bloody experiment it was. They have killed, they have executed a king. They have thrown yes. out a king. One king had six wives. And through that process, <laughs> he, changed, he changed the church. It was not a question. Yes, yes. Way. But he did that so that he could defy the church. So it was a yes. matter of diplomacy and strategy for Henry VIII. So they have tried all sorts of things. And slowly, slowly they came to a point where the kings and queens could not speak English anymore. They were mm. speaking only German. 
So yes. That yes. Parliament saw the chance and then threw them out almost. They made, they made them from the time of the Hanoverians, they became gradually figureheads. Yes. So they've had a thousand years to experiment. Mm -hmm. So when you have a thousand years to experiment, you can afford an unwritten constitution. Because right. the final document is so perfect that uh, and they have many features that nobody else has. Mm. Because parliament is supreme over there. The judiciary in uh, UK is rather weak. Mm -hmm. Because what is the constitution is what the parliament of the day decides on that day. <laughs> Somebody else comes right. after five years and then they change it, then that becomes a new constitution. Right. So no other country can afford that unwritten constitution experiment because we mm -hmm. don't have thousand years. Yes. We wrote our constitution after some two years, eleven months, or something like that. What? Two, yes. Something, something of that sort. So. What do you do within an abbreviated? And most countries have written their constitution with big time constraint. Mm -hmm. So they just tried to do the best they could. And uh, sometimes, as I've indicated in chapter five, they also changed it slightly, which is what I'm asking for India. Then right. we, we need a mid-course correction. Mm -hmm. So the two parts of your question, I hope I've given you answers for both these things. Right. Right. Yes, sir. Uh, now, um, in chapter one itself, on page 101, you have listed seven recurring uh, issues that kept recurring in the post-independence uh, debates. The absence of any mention of God in any chapter, way. In chapter, two, chapter two. Chapter two. Uh, it, yeah, it's in chapter two. Yes, sir. India 1.0. So you have 101. listed 101. Yes, sir. Mm, so you've listed yes, sir. seven concerns. And then you have later condensed those seven concerns into three uh, main critical issues, which, which is on page 139, I believe. It's yes. whether whether our constitution uh, further the national unity and still encourage regional pride, howsoever the latter may be expressed. Does it facilitate a, a feeling of common nationhood among Hindus and Muslims who together yes. make, make up 94% of the population? And third, yes. does it foster a sense of equality among the groups that are widely different in terms of social and economic status? So Correct. could you please throw us a little bit of light on whether the constitution does indeed uh, fulfill these, these requirements? Shall we... Take the first one first and the page 101 yes, shall we take it first and then we can go to page 138, 139 second. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Huh. So, 1 through 7 mm -hmm. in page 101, 102 are simply a listing of those subjects. Mm -hmm that occurred most frequently in the debates. The debates yes. were 165 days. Mm -hmm. uh, and some of these things that kept coming again and again, and members kept harking back to these issues, no right. matter which article was being discussed. Mm -hmm. Many articles are there in the draft constitution. And they took up article by article. And then it was not just an open-ended, freewheeling discussion. Most of 48, they drafted the seven member group drafted the constitution and mm. i think early late 48 or early 49 they started serious discussion article by article right but whatever be the article these seven somehow kept coming again and again absence mm. of a mention of god yes and in now 500 5, 5000 years civilization uh, sanatan dharma is not within the document is only fleeting yes. not, nothing uh, nothing is. Nothing at all, yes. Uh, the problems of the socially and economically vulnerable sections of society were not at being addressed. The members complained that mm. this is not being addressed enough. Yes. It was a great concern that we are a very poor country and also that the poor people were extremely poor. Mm, right. You know, average lifespan of a man was 27, of a woman was 21. Yes, so yes. forget all these things. Then the balance between strong center and strong states, you know, that federalism issue. That yes. kept coming again and again. Mm -hmm. Then the fifth one was a humorous, this national language business. 
Yes. Were some of the lightest moments of the debates <laughs> have come in that. Set. It was a very long, I believe there were uh, 200 questions. And the president <laughs> took up all the questions. He, he, gave a say, he gave a free say to everybody. Mm -hmm. And even the matter of the Devanagari numerals, it was yes. a very long discussion. They went on and on forever. So, <laughs> then the sixth one is this, whether we need this Rajya Sabha. Yes, important. That, that kept coming again and again. Right. And then people went back to this famous unwritten constitution of mm. the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. And then right, the right. only difference that these fellows could make is that it looks like the House of Lords. Right, yes. You know, so that was the... And whether the constitution is a cut and paste effort, because this is a criticism yes. that continues till today. Till today, yes. Till today. You see that I think somebody has said that a British uh, constitution for Indians or something. And yes. even at that time, people were saying. So this was, these seven are simply listed in how often it came up in the discussions. Now yes. let's go to page 101. 101 actually summarizes the three what I call fault lines. Right. The fault, yes. the fault lines. Uh, what hmm. was it? 139, is it, Abhijit? 138, 139. 138, 139. See, they, they, they were all very educated people. Mm -hmm. They were not, uh, and I would say, considering the range of political affiliations they had, their remarks and uh, uh, interjections Mm -hmm. were all remarkably nationalistic. Okay. They actually mm -hmm. kept aside their political things. Little bit here and there, it's bound to come in. But you had almost mm -hmm. from extreme left to extreme right. Right. And yet there is a certain uniformity of passion mm -hmm. and a uniformity of commitment and a uniformity of feeling for this country. You know, most of them were overjoyed that mm -hmm. we had become independent. And even right. though the independence came with the tragedy of partition, which yes. again weighed very deeply in the, among the members, they couldn't even believe that partition had happened. They were traumatized. Not right. just people from Punjab and Bengal, but everybody. Mm -hmm. Oh no, everybody felt horrible about that. Mm -hmm. And in spite of that, they knew that what they were drafting, I think by the end of the exercise, did not address these three fault lines sufficiently. They tried to. Okay. Still encourage regional pride, national unity. This is the famous center state problem. Yes. Problem of federalism. Yes. So, which is still not solved properly, in my opinion. Yes. So, whatever mm -hmm. the constitution has armed us with in this regard is not enough. Mm -hmm. Not enough for us because, again, as I said, I must emphasize. We must all operate only within the four corners of the constitution. We can't come outside. Yes. yes. So we, whatever the constitution has armed us with regards to all these things, we, it is not sufficient because if it was sufficient, we would have done it, no? Yes. We have not been able to do it. So still, still they're fighting. You know, they're still whining, they're still fighting and, you know, it's not, not a happy situation. Second, right. feeling of common nationhood. Among Hindus. Yes. Hindus. Now, this is again a very deep question. Firstly, it must this must be viewed in the background of partition. Yes. And uh, the, if you read the comments made in the debates, mm -hmm. the terrific fear among all the members is that we would quickly have a second religion based partition of the country. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, of what was then called India, they feared that there would be another religion-based partition. And if that had happened, then believe me, this country would have collapsed. Yes. We would not have been able to. Also, the fact that 97% of the Muslims in India voted for partition, but only about 45% actually went there. Right. Mm -hmm. to Pakistan. So why did all these people not go there? Mm -hmm. the various things I have mentioned, that how Patel mm -hmm. and all wanted Ambedkar, they wanted a complete exchange of population. Right, like yes. For example, if you take at the end of Second World War, when all Recent the Turkey. European borders moved west, mm -hmm. Russia moved west into what was Poland. Yes. 
Poland border also moved west into what is Germany. Yes. The Polish population in what became Russia, mm -hmm. I mean, much many parts of Ukraine now had mm -hmm. Polish population. Yes. You know, Lviv, Lvov and, you know, the westernmost areas of Poland. So all the Polish population was forcibly pushed into what now is eastern Poland. Mm -hmm. For example, the great city of Breslau, a uh, thousand year mm -hmm. city, which is now called Wroclaw. Mm -hmm. uh, Breslau was a major German center for a thousand years. The population of Breslau and the, what is now Silesia, what was Silesia, was again forcibly pushed westwards. Mm -hmm. so there was a complete exchange of population. No Poles remained in right. what was now Ukraine, Russia. No Germans remained in what is now Western Poland. And what Patel, Ambedkar and others were saying is we must go for full population exchange. Okay. Mm -hmm. For various reasons, including the strange terms of the Nehru Liaquat Pact and all that. Okay. This was not done neatly. Right. It was not done neatly and we don't know. This is a hypothetical question. Would both countries have been better off if there was a full exchange of population? We yes, don't right. know. We, we really we don't, don't know. We don't know. Yeah. But this is you know, one of the unanswered things. We don't uh, try to answer hypothetical questions. But this is something that was not done. Now, yes. Ha having left with the situation of 80% and 14% or whatever those numbers are now. Maybe they're slightly mm -hmm. different, but I guess not very different. So with this 80-14 thing, do Hindus and Muslims feel a common nationhood? Mm -hmm. Today, my opinion for what it's worth is that neither Hindus nor Muslims feel any common nation. <laughs> Hindus feel shortchanged. Muslims mm -hmm. feel uh, endangered. Mm -hmm. So nobody, nobody is particularly happy. And right. here I this point number two fault line Hindu Muslim. Here I squarely blame the constitution. Mm -hmm. It has not done the things properly. Especially if you take article 15, sections 3 to 6 and all that and then go to 29 and all that stuff. Article 29. Right. This is not good. It is not good because partly they bent over backwards in some of these things because they were scared of that second partition. Mm -hmm. So they didn't want to do the least thing that will make the Muslims feel mm -hmm. endangered. But right. you see, now it has come back in a reverse way. Mm -hmm. That if you take Shaheen Bagh or today this Haldwani, you know, he, yes. I mean, I'll throw a hypothetical question to listeners of the program. Mm -hmm. which I have asked many of my friends and got very humorous answers. Like suppose hypothetically we say tomorrow Pakistan crumbles. Mm -hmm. And suppose we say a lot of people in Punjab over there, Pakistani Punjab, out of sheer fear and power and hunger, try to come over to India. What will be our reaction? We will say, people answers, answers I get is no, no, it won't happen. Or they will never leave. I said, you never know what starvation can do to somebody. Yes, yes. They may go anywhere where there is some food to eat. Yes. Then this will suddenly our Supreme Court say that they are better citizens than all of us. Given our presence, <laughs> they will say that. So I think right. these, these are sorts of situations that I think people should look. But this second thing, this Hindu-Muslim thing. Mm -hmm. Again, once again, in the first case, I will say... Federal, it has not empowered us enough to solve this problem. Mm -hmm. I think in the second fault line, Hindu-Muslim, this constitution has actively worked against Hindus and Muslims feeling a common nation. It has actually right. gone against. It is not. Mm -hmm. It is not just that it has not empowered people enough. It has had a very negative effect. Mm -hmm. The third one is more complicated. This is the upper caste, lower caste business. Yes, yes. That is the third fault line. If the first mm -hmm. fault line was center state, the second fault line is Hindu Muslim, the third fault line is upper caste, lower caste. Right. 
here i would say certain things the constitution did correctly mm-hmm. if you take article 17 Mm-hmm. then when it outlaws untouchability in very strong language this is something that had to be done right from of course 1900 and so on even before the rss was started and stuff like that people have talked about the evils of untouchability if you mm-hmm. take that uh, srinivas uh, ayengar's constitution of 1927 mm-hmm. the first thing he says whether or not we get independence we must remove untouchability right hmm and this was a upper class brahmin speaking yes okay he incidentally was the mentor of k kamaraj not me i see the for, future uh, yes, chief yes. minister right yeah, mm-hmm. chief minister and congress president and so many things so right, right. this is the kind of thing and of course ambedkar articulated the whole thing in such a way after the pune pact of 31 that the scheduled castes would have a definite say in the constitution and there was no question of any constitution being written without proper redressal done to the scheduled castes that that mm-hmm. part they did correctly okay the subsequent thing that happened with obcs and all that mm-hmm. again there it is because of the historical realities of what was going on in mysore and madras mm-hmm. where it was not really you know caste but the word was class class yes ha huh. and there was a difference hmm between backward classes backward classes as defined in mysore and madras in those days mm mm-hmm. simply meant anyone who was not a brahmin i see i see mm mm-hmm. mm-hmm. it didn't mean anything else mm-hmm. which is why still in the south you will hear phraseologies which you don't hear elsewhere in the country brahmin non brahmin okay that comes from those days i see and so they had mysore in 1890 itself started a system of reservations in madras with 1920 with the justice party coming to power they started it in tamil nadu in madras in those days it was called so hmm. they these things had already been there and ambedkar said that if we didn't take this fact into account Mm-hmm. there would be no represent a proper representation for people who were called backward classes in some of the southern states mm-hmm. and in the process when they had the original reservation of 22.5% mm-hmm. it was never specifically mentioned but it seems to me that all these classes of reserved subjects will come in this 22.5% okay what happened with vp singh and mandal and all that in my opinion mm. was a travesty right because then you are getting to ambedkar's crazy situation where he said if it is 70% reservation there's no reservation at all But right yes 59 you know and many mm. of the states have crossed 50 there is no sanctity for that 50 also 49.5 right. or there is no sanctity for anything today karnataka is now 56 or so so we, there is no sanctity for any of these numbers anymore and now it has actually degenerated into simple electoral politics yes it has so if you take some constituency and you say this one that one this caste that caste so you will fix up a reservation that will see that you win the election yes something like that approximately yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. i can't take it very exactly so if you take these three fault lines center state insufficient empowerment hindu muslim constitution actually acts against it mm-hmm. foster a sense of equality is something neither here nor there what it has done it seems to be almost irrelevant in fact there is learned commentators from the us and all who are now talking about this that mm-hmm. whether any kind of reservation is good at all in the long run right mm-hmm. they say that the people who are given reservations feel patronized yes and the feeling people who are not getting benefits of reservation their sense of anger is so great that uh, you cannot make so large percentage of your people this angry right so there is also psychological and sociological factors behind this so i mm. think on the whole these three fault lines our famous constitution has done not done a great deal <laughs> to help us 
And once again, I will repeat to the point of exhaustion, <laughs> we are forced to only operate within the bounds of this constitution. Yes. So this, is, this, this is this page uh, 138-139 discussion. These are right, the three yes. facts. And to try to solve some of these fault lines, then we have to start looking a little deeper. Yes, which is what I've tried to do in the rest of the book. Right, sir. So what are the uh, major uh, points that you propose for amending this entire situation? What are the what I would like to ask is what are the characteristics of India 2.0, which is Bharat? Do we need a new constituent assembly, new constitution, new system of governance, maybe a US style presidential system? Of course, we know that uh, you have uh, proposed uh, creating 75 states, which is one of the major things that you propose. So what are the characteristics of India 2.0? That you propose. So, to, yeah, to, to understand my solutions, you first have to acknowledge that India is a civilizational state and not a nation state. Indeed, indeed. So, this chapter 3, which is the shortest chapter in the book, but I view it as a kind of, you know, cusp of the whole book. Hmm. Because still the end of chapter 2, our constitution and all that. Yes. Our constitution is written as if we are a nation state. <laughs> yes, yes. That's the problem. And we are not a nation state. So it's we're like not. telling somebody to wear some clothes that are too tight or too loose. Yes. We cannot, we will not feel very comfortable with garments like that. Yes. And this country has not felt comfortable. There's no doubt about it. Why are so many of right. our people running away to foreign countries and willing to do even menial things, drive a yes. taxi in Toronto or something? Yes. His father probably owned many acres of land in Punjab. Hmm. Why does he want to go and drive a taxi in Toronto? I mean, one must also ask. These yes. are not crazy people. No. They are not crazy people. Why are they doing all these things? Do people in other countries do such things? <laughs> they don't. They don't. They don't. And hmm. I tell you, I tell you something, Abhijit. Mm -hmm. In the course of my travels over the last 50 years, I have seen some very poor countries. Hmm. In Asia and Africa. Mm. They don't behave like this. Right. This is very serious because today mm. we are talking that you know we're going to be number three, number two, we want to be this, we want to be that. Why do people behave in this? This is what you have to look at. So civilizational. So what yes. is a civilization state? You have to understand what is a nation state. Yes. And since I don't want to spend time on that, I go to you. They can read, people can read the book. You have to go to European history because that is where the nation state idea began. Yes. So, and why that nation state? Actually, even the nation state idea in Europe underwent a morph before yes. Metternich in 1815 and then uh, from 1815 to 1918, which was the end of the First World War, that had one idea. After 1918, the nation state idea was completely different. Yes. So, in fact, I have argued many times and many people have agreed with me 100% that in terms of the whole history of the world, World War I is far more important than World War II. Yes, it is. That world War I was a real big, you know, what you may call a point of disruption. The whole world changed. The world was never the same after 1918. Yes. You know, because the idea of empires was over and with the idea of empire being over, the colonies were gone. Britain just lasted another 20, 25, 30 years. That's all. So right. then it lost India and that was the biggest thing. So anyway, coming back to civilizational state, that leads to then a discussion of what is Sanatana Dharma. What is Hinduism. Right. Mm -hmm. That is very important for the reader to, unless you understand what Hindutva is, mm -hmm. as meant by serious people who propose this term, not all these other things that are there's a lot of noise associated Jesus. with Hindutva, which is more coming as a result from the political parties. Yes, but yes. As I say, the thing, firstly, Hindu is a, okay, it is an indigenous word because it either comes from, there are two theories, by the way. I don't mention both of them. I only say from Sindhu, Persian, Indus River. It also comes from the word Hindu, meaning moon. Mm -hmm. And it is a purely Indic origin for the word, you know, Hindu. I see, so, I see. Huh, so the, I've written in the book that uh, 
Hinduism and Hindutva, there's no point in distinguishing between them because what is important there is the Hindu part, not the ism or the dwa. Yes. Anybody who has even a rudimentary understanding of Sanskrit will yes. know that dwa means simply the, the feeling of being that. That's all. Yeah. Feeling of being a Hindu. Yeah. Hindu dwa. I mean, why why do you make it into something which is <laughs> very big and not really intended? So, so what is Hindutva? Unless you know what is Hindutva and appreciate the correct meaning of that Hindutva, you will not understand why we are a civilizational state. We should also know, readers of the book should know, that there are only two civilizational states in the world today. One is India and yes. one is China. China so, yes. These also happen to be the biggest countries, most populated countries. Hmm. It means maybe in the course of history, civilizational state was a very stable way of being. That is why these two countries became so rich. Yes. So that civilizational state idea itself is a very stable idea hmm. for a large country. Hmm. A large country with many diversities, which also means China also has some diversities. It is We are much more diverse. And this brings me to the solution that is, Every successful country in the world throughout history, throughout history, has capitalized on its strongest point. Mm -hmm. It has leveraged its strongest point because no other country can catch that in that point. Yes. Now we, on the other hand, in our wisdom, have highlighted our weakest points. Huh. Center state, Hindu, Muslim, upper caste, lower caste. We right. talk about nothing else. These are the only things that we get fixated about. These are the weakest parts of our nation. Yes. What is the strongest part? The strongest part is our diversity. Diversity. Yes. I mean, yeah, just to give a, I love culinary examples. Mm -hmm. So if you eat a masal dosa in Bangalore and a masal dosa in Chennai, they taste different. Yes, yes. Yeah, everybody knows that. And so isn't it nice? Isn't it nice that they are different? It's beautiful to have diversity. It's beautiful. Exactly. That is beautiful. Yes. For the first time in this podcast, we have used the word, we have used the word beautiful. So what is beautiful and so permanent and essential part of us? Mm -hmm. How to highlight this diversity? Right. And then, then comes the crucial thing. I leave it to the readers of the book to go through my arguments in chapter four. But the 75 states, the very common reaction is, if you have 75 states, it will break up. Right. Hmm. It will break up. And they're hmm. saying, if you have Muslim majority states, there are six of them in my scheme. Hmm, yes. Hmm. And you see, my first state is Gilgit, which is now looking increasingly likely that it will become a state of India. Not because of anything we do, but because they themselves want to come here. Looks like that, yes. If you look, my state number one in the list is Gilgit. State yes, number two is Baltistan. Baltistan. I have written all these things six months before all these things have happened. <laughs> so let's face it, my ability to predict things, I don't belong to any <laughs> diplomatic service or any police group or anything like that to know. So just believe me that my ability to predict these things is rather high. <laughs> you did so. Gilgit as the first state in the list of 75 right. states. See, so, coming back to this, it's our diversity. So, the important thing here is, in a nation state, more states will lead to fragmentation. Like in a nation state. Slovakia, Yugoslavia. Yes. All, so, all those, the old Russia, or USSR. Mm. It will lead. In a civilizational state, more states only strengthens. Because it brings right. out, it exploits diversity. And this diversity, this can also be leveraged economically. If you have a small state, a small state can pick one or two niche items, which only it mm -hmm. can produce and nobody else can do. Mm -hmm. And you can then make that into a super world level economy. I always like to talk right. about Kashmir, my Kashmir, which is just the valley. Mm -hmm. can become the world leader in rose oil and lavender oil. Right. Kutch, Kutch can become the world leader in solar energy. Solar energy, yes. Uh, and uh, Kungu, which is the Coimbatore part of 
present day Kongunad, uh, will become yeah. the world leader in textiles. Mm -hmm. We'll beat Bangladesh. So we have got actually 75 economic powerhouses. Right. So today, if Kongunad is, well, see, Chennai is very far away. For mm -hmm. people in Coimbatore, and one way of mm -hmm. looking at it. Yes. Which is still far away from uh, Tanjore, which is still far away from Madurai. Right. So each of these places can develop themselves and make a super economic thing. Mm -hmm. So by making small states, this enhancing diversity in a civilizational state, because we have this huge Sanatan Dharma, which actually yes. covers all religions. It doesn't, it is a world, it's a universal view of things. Right. It is a universal view. It is, not, it is not religion specific at all. It is a super, if you listen to Vivekananda and Radha Krishna, they say that mm. this, what they call Neo Hinduism, Neo Vedanta and all, that it is coming above the traditional mores of a religion. Okay. Actually, a universal concept of looking at life and the universe itself. Mm -hmm. So, in such a scenario, this diversity will only enhance and it will make everything much, much better because it's, there's, no, there's no conflict, inherent conflict. So, right. the solution is also based on that. And I leave it to the readers to then figure out because I've also used geography, history, so many other things. And right. also some agitations which have happened and where people have naturally expressed. People don't uh, go and take to the streets and start saying we want this and we want this. It's not always political. It is not always, uh, you know, uh, excuse me. I'm sorry. No problem. I've switched switch this damn thing off. I'm really sorry for this. No problem, sir. No problem. Oh, good. Problem with these phones. I should have done that. I really apologize. No problem. Uh, no problem. Coming back to this states business. Uh, mm -hmm. You can economically leverage, geographically it makes sense, historically mm -hmm. it makes sense, and it is completely compatible with the civilizational state. So there won't be any mm -hmm. balkanization. And right. which is what many people immediately they'll say, oh, 75 is it. And don't forget, Gandhi wanted 750 states. <laughs> and I have, I have using the pointillist argument with the color pictures mm -hmm. in yes. the middle of it, I have shown why 75 is sort of the best number. Right. So it is not. It is not some number that Professor Desiraju just dreamed out of the top of his head. So once again, there is some rationale between using that that seventy-five thing. Anything more would be a superfluous kind of a thing. Anything mm. less than that would be insufficient. Right. So there is always that little beautiful golden area in the middle, which is what we should shoot for. And because the states and all should not be created in demand of because of some agitations and all. That is why I say yes. you need a constituent assembly. And the mm. last but most important caveat, Abhijit, is that yes. the 75 states must come with the US form of governance. It has to be a full separation of the legislature and the executive. We don't want 75 right. chief ministers running around for <laughs> No, we don't want that. Yes. So, yes, if yes. you have an elected president and elected governors, they bring their cabinet, which goes with those fellows. Yes. Hmm, they don't have legislative powers. And whom we elect, our members of parliament and members of the assembly, will have hmm. only legislative powers. Nothing. And else. no, yeah, right. No executive right. power. No executive. So then, what happens is this mad rush to become ministers will end. Yes. With that, corruption will come down. It will not end, but it will Indeed. come down. It, it will, yes. And then what will happen is that the president or the governor, the elected president or the elected governor, will have full freedom to bring in the best people, best men and women for the job. Yes. You can bring in technocrats. You can yes. bring in people from civil society. You can bring in top lawyers, top scientists, top businessmen. And yes. many of these people for national service would like to come and you know, work for five years and go back. Definitely. 
there is no uh, there is no bad implication attached to this thing yes the, what yes. we have is a necessary and a natural uh, you know thing for these ministers yes true uh, minister comes and also so many sort of security people and this and that wandering around and uh, garlands and you know gifts and everybody jumping and all the hangers on where do we see this in other countries please we do not you do not see it anywhere do you see it in the most powerful country of the world yes we, we have the problems i am not saying that that is all is hunky dory in, in the us but they won't have this kind of a situation yes and the idea of with the small state and then you see when keeping the legislature the legislature also will become strong hmm. they will feel like having good discussions and they will feel like passing the best laws because the yes. option of that legislature becoming corrupt becomes far less it's still there hmm. it won't be altogether gone there will be hmm. some special interests in the legislature just like they are in the us house and senate yes there. but yeah. by separating this executive and legislature you will also be able to control the judges if you do this ah the judges that's mm, also the a very big point is another big thing so that mm. the executive need never feel in conflict with the judiciary right that the judiciary and the legislature hack it out with themselves indeed because then the judiciary will be able to say whether you are passing right laws or not mm -hmm. let them have the debate finally you know for you and me and all the common citizens of this country only that executive matters for us yes you know we need to get our daily jobs done and we need to have daily life in a much more convenient and easy way yes so we elect we elect the president we elect governors who can best help us and then you see even these political parties it doesn't matter if you have different political party in these small states and by having a small state no big state can become politically troublesome true what we have now so my model actually i think it's a win win situation because you get what i call a politically strong center and economically strong states for uh -huh. the reasons i have for the reasons i have explained now what does the state need state doesn't need political power state needs money yes today the states don't get money because of the way in which our constitution is written and gst is some latest attempt to redress what was a very bad situation before but still i am sure the states don't feel good that they have to go always with a begging bowl to the center center yes huh. so the center actually if you think about it carefully apart from money for defense army strategic things center doesn't need money for too much else yes something like education can go completely into the state domain right yes mm. we do not need to have central education institutions why why do we need mm. that a student from bengal should be able to feel happy going to a very good say iit level or iser level or iim level thing in bengal itself yes anybody's first instinct is to go and study in a place close to home yes in most countries in the world they do that yes. only here we have somebody from uh, kochi going to you know agartala to study mm yes yes this is not good none of this is actually very healthy if you look at it and so yeah. i think the 75 states idea is something that is grounded in a lot of practicality as i said we like to propose solutions right tomorrow you come and tell me okay we need 60 or we need 100 those are all matters of detail yeah Uh, that that is really the sum and substance and chapter 5 the last one uh, it tells that all is not lost because big and powerful countries have taken about 100 years to fine tune their constitution yes right so you don't have to expect that it has only us got its constitution bingo right at the very first attempt they did <laughs> they, they did okay just give it to them i mean they did yes, fine yes. so yes. none of the other countries we have not done it like that so it's okay we will but there's no point in thinking the holy book yes right no need to worship it and say that everything there is some some god or something no no god is not mentioned but god never gave us that book <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> you know if you want to look at it like that 
And so mm. I think that's sort of where I have left the reader. And I think reader should then draw his own conclusions and maybe try to write his own book on this matter. Mm. Mm. You know, I'm throwing a challenge. I'm saying that somebody who's not a lawyer and not a social science professor is able to write this. Then come on, anybody can, actually anybody can do anything if you feel that you are interested in this country and wanted to come up properly. Right. And there's no point in reading my book and saying, no, 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 but this is like this. No, 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 but Muslims are like that. Look at what is happening first. First, listen to the main thing. The constitution still is not correct. Then I think there will be a lot of cobwebs will be cleared. I have heard a lot of comments from people. Oh, no, you are saying things which are impractical. Nothing will uh -huh. change in this country. No matter what you write, I cannot imagine this happening in 200 years. They will mm. not want to have a constituent assembly. Mm. You know what I mean? Any politician is very sensitive to the moods of the people. Yes. If they feel that the people want a new constitution, they will have a new constituent assembly. Right. On their own, they don't come and tell. A politician is not required to come and tell you that I want to do this or I want to do that. He just sees what the people are feeling. Yes. The better the politician, the more accurately he senses what people really want. True. Yes. You know? And so I think yes. that's the we all have to look at this in a much more balanced and civilized way. We should not jump and you know get emotional and emotional you know, take to the streets and you know the so-called extreme left and extreme right and I don't really go with much of this, but um, that's me. And uh, that's why I've written it in a way that, yes, people should read this book casually, mm -hmm. get all the facts, and then start thinking yes. about what this country is all about. Because this country, this great land of ours, 5,000 years old, I think it now demands of its people that they begin to take more interest in this wonderful yes. place where we've all been lucky enough to be born, you know. Yes, yes. No Indian today. That's why I feel that I've written somewhere. These things can happen in Bharat. They won't happen in India. <laughs> Correct. Yes. So, so sir, uh, what, what next after this book? Is there a sequel in the works possibly? Maybe on some other topic? <laughs> some other topic sequel, it's there. But it's mm. a bit unrelated to this topic. But now I have... I kind of like the idea of writing non-scientific books. So you, yes, yes, you've treated this as an experiment in writing a non-fiction book, right, sir? Yeah, for me, everything is an experiment because I am mm. an experimental scientist. I am not a theoretician. Right. So unless I see something, I can feel something, I can smell something, especially in chemistry. Uh, mm. I can hear something also in chemistry. Uh -huh. So <laughs> unless I am able to do all these things. Uh, for me, then it's not only then it's reality. So right. I'm strongly driven by the experimental urge and a curiosity. So yes, right. I am writing another thing, and hopefully we'll see what happens when it sees the light of day. But uh, I always write my books quickly. I, mm -hmm. take, I took two and a half months to write this book from start. Right. To yes. I mm -hmm. took about six, six months of reading. And two of two and a half months, the actual writing. So I see, I see. Normally, when I get seriously into writing, I don't take too much time because there's an idea that's waiting to be waiting to come out. Right. You don't you don't write a book because somebody told you to write a book. And that won't work. Write, <laughs> nah, it'll never work. Mm. You've got to feel. You've got to feel the book. You've got to live the book as you're writing it. You've really right, got to. Yes. Live it. See, that mm. is coming back to the essence of Advaita and um, what the great Mahavakyas of the Upanishads tell us. Mm -hmm. You have to be it. You have to be that book when you're writing it. Otherwise, it won't come out. Otherwise, it looks like some thing that you're doing because somebody has commissioned you to write something. Yes. You know, just write a book mm. for the sake of writing a book. Like I can say as a scientist that... Uh, in the end, what matters is not the number of papers you've got, but what is in those papers. Yes, yes. That is why this H-index citation which you mentioned is so very important. 
100. <laughs> 100. That's, yeah, even I myself was surprised. I mean, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a big number by any token. And it's Indeed. a number whose significance need not be underemphasized. There's a lot of mm -hmm. debate on H index as to what it really means. But mm -hmm. H indexes go very high. Usually they have some significance. Yes, some impact, real genuine impact. They have they have some impact when yeah definitely I mean and hundred yes. is is quite it's quite difficult <laughs> yes I, sir yes I will sir. say that I don't want to appear to be falsely modest or anything like that but <laughs> yeah so sir the last question I would like to ask you is do you have any advice for youngsters for instance how can youngsters contribute this is a question I get often how how can youngsters contribute to making Bharat 2.0 great and restoring Bharat to its uh, civilizational greatness. What would you say about that? First, be curious. Mm -hmm. First, be interested in everything around you. Mm -hmm. huh? I know you're all youngsters are very anxious about their future. They're anxious about getting a job. They want to be solvent. This is all very important. But don't forget that if you have a general natural curiosity and alertness about who you are and what you are, I think that's the first step. Second thing I'll tell them is the youngsters of today, the people for whom I've written this book, hmm. you people are all extraordinarily lucky because uh, we see our country on the threshold of real greatness. Hmm. Now, whether it really becomes great or whether it's sort of just plodding along depends on you, you the youngsters. Mm -hmm. My generation, we made a lot of mistakes, mostly sins of omission. The biggest mistake we made was to keep quiet. Mm -hmm. because we didn't even understand. Today, don't underestimate the importance of social media. The kind of podcast we are doing now. Yes. You are a very successful and uh, well-known podcaster with a very wide outreach. And Thank you, sir. Uh, you, yes, absolutely. Who can, who can deny? And uh, so the sort of outreach and the way of rapidity with which certain messages uh, come through, there mm. will be a lot of noise. In science, we call it the signal to noise problem. Yes. There is a lot of noise which tends to cancel itself out. But then signals come and the signals are very stable. And so you have an ability to communicate. You youngsters will have an ability to communicate with people in distant corners of the country. Mm -hmm. And then you will suddenly start realizing that all of you have a lot of skin in this game to take this India thing and make it into Bharat. And Bharat for me means economically we should be first. Yes. For me, that's the most important in the world always. Money counts, only money counts. <laughs> Without Artha, you cannot perform Dharma properly. Our Indeed. ancients knew that. Why is it yes. called Artha Shastra? You know, famous. Yeah. Why do you call it Artha Shastra? What is that Artha mm. doing there in that? So let us not underestimate the importance of legitimately earned money. Yes. Mm -hmm. Let me qualify. And you will realize that in an attempt to do this, you youngsters also must, must educate yourselves to the level which you feel reasonable and feasible. I traveled recently to Bengal and mm. uh, an educational institution and people there told me that many young people in Bengal have actually stopped educating themselves after school. I see. Mm. This was very disturbing to me. This was news to me. I didn't realize mm. this was happening. They said that they have found out that they're able to earn some, you know, relatively minor amounts of money. But it's enough to keep them going when they live together with their families and things like that. So it mm -hmm. becomes a sort of a subsistence thing. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, yeah, kind of a low input, low output, low throughput sort of life. 
and they decided that it is simply too difficult to educate yourself what with the present system of reservations and this and that and corruptions and not making not even able to get some place where and they said as a result the quality of teaching has also deteriorated oh i see so they said we don't even have good teachers to do all these things anymore so mm. i mean this is abhijit this is the real situation today mm. so i think maybe youngsters should get more into self education learning from the internet you know focusing better prioritizing your one's time better mm. and see what you can do to make a real difference because the success of the us if you ask me mm-hmm. which is the one independently successful chemist, uh, country in the world history in the last 2 300 years Mm. is that the moment individual good is harnessed to collective good yes then nothing can stop a country yes because inherently the human nature is a selfish nature yes you want things for yourself and quite rightly so because mm. this is this is how human beings are wired mm. so given the situation the individual good is very important what that famous us constitution has done is that right from the beginning in its very short documentation shortest yes seven pages how put the individual good and the collective good together yes you know that famous first amendment and second amendment the right to bear arms all that was very much a part of the individual and mm. yet i talked about rights and duties somewhere you are told that you have rights but only you have to follow your duties yes you know and that is implicit in that us constitution mm and that is why the what is us nationality very difficult to answer that question what is it about that us that they all feel part of the same nation people emigrate there from all over the world within yes. a generation or two they lose all memory of the old place yes it's the only country where that happens mm it doesn't happen in uk for example it does not happen right. in the uk for five six generations they are still coming back to punjab and doing all sorts of things <laughs> yes true mm you know when you go to mm. the us you become american i know because i was there 50 years ago and decided not to live there permanently in fact i told you why when mm. they briefly i had a green card and then threw it off and came back totally jobless to india <laughs> i see <laughs> no job nothing i said don't want to stay here that's all <laughs> wow <laughs> so i never regretted it for a moment mm. and, uh, yeah if i had stayed there i wouldn't have written a bharat book i would not have written a book on the us constitution that's for sure <laughs> <laughs> right yes that is that is what you mean by a sense of belonging mm skin in the game i said no yes sir skin in the game you will get like this that, that is what the, please realize something youngsters that this is uh, india is a worthwhile experiment today right so it's up to all of you you will do well individually if you push collectively also mm and above all do stop this terrible habit of arguing about everything <laughs> the other man is also right he may be partially right but you are never fully right and the other man is never fully wrong mm. please remember that we indians are very poor listeners and very good speakers mm. <laughs> so learn how to listen the other guy also has a point try to understand it If you do all this when we worry a little bit more about the others, its collective good will come automatically. Indeed. Right, sir. Thank you so much for those wonderful words of wisdom, and thank you for a fascinating conversation. Brilliant topic, and thank you for writing the book as well. Uh, so, so with that, we conclude the podcast. It was a great pleasure and honor speaking to, uh, speaking with you, uh, Professor Desi Raju, and I look forward to our next conversation. Abhijit, it's been a great pleasure, and 
able to share my thoughts and uh, this book is is slowly growing within me now <laughs> <laughs> i wrote it and all and got it published but slowly i myself am thinking more about what i have written so i'm not stop thinking about it and uh, we shall have to see how it goes i am also looking forward to our next conversation and yes sir absolutely very, very nice of you to host me today and uh, i hope listeners also got something out of this thank you very much sir